we can get started with our first panel. So following on the words of uh, Dr. Sullivan, our first panel provides a look at the risks faced by coastal communities. Our moderator is Austin Becker from the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources at Stanford University. Austin has been doing some great work on ports and sea level rise, and we're excited to have this group together to talk about coastal vulnerability. Austin will introduce the other panelists. And I'd like to remind everybody again that this year we will be taking questions at the end of the panel's uh, remarks by virtue of the cards. And so if you haven't picked up cards yet, we're going to have volunteers walking around collecting them and handing them out. Volunteers, can you raise your hand? Everybody take a look. We've got two volunteers. We've got four volunteers who will be walking around collecting cards over the course of the hour. So with that, let me turn it over to Austin. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we're going to try to do this a little bit less formally, so we're, we're, we're not going to go up there, <laughs> we'll sit over here. Um, so this, this panel is motivated by this question, how do we frame appropriate timelines for planning and investment to address climate change for our urban coasts? And we've got two amazing discussants here, um, Lindine and Kelly, who I'm going to briefly introduce. And then I'll give a, a very quick background and just kind of try to get us all on the same page around this question and turn it over to them um, to, in, to discuss some of the work that they've been doing in this area. And hopefully we'll have about a half hour left for questions. Um, so there's people circulating around. If you have a question, write it on the card, raise your hand, and um, somebody will come pick it up and, and bring it up here. So on my left here is Lindine Patton. Uh, Lindine is the Chief Climate Product Officer for Zurich Insurance Group. She's responsible for product development and risk management related to climate change. She's a member of the World Economic Forum, the Glo uh, Global Advisory Council on Measuring Sustainability, as well as a member of the World Economic Forum Advisory Board on Sustainability and Competitiveness. She's the Vice Chair of the Climate Change and Tort Liability Subcommittee of the Geneva Association a member of the Advisory Council to, resources, to the uh, Resources for the Future Center for the Management of Ecological Wealth, on numerous other government and non-governmental advisory boards, uh, including the Advisory Board for the University of California at Santa Barbara's Bren School uh, of Environmental Science and Management. She's an attorney licensed in California and here in D.C., and uh, and an American Board of Industrial Hygiene Certified Industrial Hygienist. We'll see how that comes into play today. Probably not at Hopefully all. Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, she has a BS from uh, UC Davis, a Master of Public Health from Berkeley, and a JD from the Santa Clara University School of Law. And Kelly Burks Copes works for the uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers. She's a research ecologist for the Army Corps' Research and Development Center Environmental Lab. And she's focused primarily on the development of tools to assess the restoration of habitats, communities, and landscapes nationwide. She's project manager for a groundbreaking study, which we'll hear about today, that addresses the risk to coastal military installations in the face of sea level rise and storm impacts. She um, has her BS from the University of Mexico, an MS in, uh, from New Mexico State, and is working on her PhD as in well. In her spare time. In her <laughs> copious amounts of spare time, which is probably between like 3 and 4 a.m. In the morning, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll be hearing more from them shortly. Um, but let me just try to set the stage here for this question of timelines. And... Um, and uh, get us all kind of on the, on the same page around some, some common issues. So what are the climate change impacts for coasts? Well, we heard very eloquently from Dr. Sullivan what many of these are. The, the, um, the main concerns, I think, for coasts, first of all, sea level rise, of course, which the current projections range anywhere from 0.6 to 2 meters by 2100. 
Uh, even 0.6 meters would be, would be devastating for many areas. W the projections are for an increase in the intensity of storm systems. So uh, a little bit less consensus around, around what's happening with storms or what could happen with storms. But in general, the expectation is for fewer tropical storms overall, but the ones that we do see will be much more intense on, on the scale of, of uh, Sandy or Katrina. Uh, more hotter days on the coasts and more precipitation on the coasts. And um, there's currently a, a major flooding event going on in Europe, um, <clears throat> and we, we will expect more of these as we move down, down the century. So coastal uses, again, we, we heard about a lot of these uh, from Dr. Sullivan. Um, you know, there's a lot of uses of the coast. Over 50% over of the population lives on the coast. Uh, we use them for recreation, beaches, uh, fishing. Uh, our ports and harbors, of course, are located on the coast. Our transportation networks, many of them follow along coastal routes. Um, we have lots of military installations, in particular Navy and Coast Guard on the coast water treatment plants, energy facilities, uh, lots and lots of coastal uses that are, that are threatened by climate change. So how do we think as people, how do we think about time and the future? Um, this is just kind of a, a, a timeline graph here. So we're, we have the present on the left, and this goes out to 2150 on the right. And most of us are, are very aware of um, this 2100 number, because in the climate change world, 2100 is a benchmark that we frequently use. It's somewhat arbitrary, um, but it's a, it's a nice round number, and we can say by 2100, we'll have X amount of sea level rise or X amount of storm surge, um, and it's something that we can, we can kind of at least partly wrap our minds around, um, something that's around 90, 90 years away. We're, we're, so the, um, this is kind of an arbitrary impacts line here, but we're, we're expecting, you know, the, this, this curve to accelerate throughout this century, and of course, even though we talk a lot about 2100, the impacts of climate change will continue to get worse beyond 2100. So, it's pretty easy for, for people to think about this year and what, they're, what they might accomplish in their lives or, or in their work, in their work plans for the next year. The five to ten year horizon um, also, you know, we, we, this is something that we're fairly used to thinking about. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit harder to be thinking about 2100. When we think about our, our own careers, maybe the things that we'd like to accomplish, the, the, the decision making that we hope to influence, um, the, the policies that we'd like to see created. We have, you know, for, for me, I'm, I'm right around 40, so maybe I work until I'm 75. I've got about 35 years to work on these issues, right? <laughs> what, you, you, think, you think I'm going to quit before 75? No, I think I'll be fertilizer by then. <laughs> <laughs> so beyond 35 years, so this, is, this, is, this, this wow. is where I turn to fertilizer. <laughs> um, so if I'm, if I'm lucky, I, I live to, to, to you know, maybe 95. Um, so I can see out to around 2070, I'll, I'll be on the planet thinking about these climate change issues and, you know, hopefully making some kind of, some kind of difference. Beyond the span of my life, maybe I can think about the lives of my non-existent children. <laughs> you can think about my kids instead. And mine too. <laughs> So, you know, the, the, a, a recent study showed that um, over half of the, the kids born in the U.S. today are going to live to be 105. Okay, so, so when we start thinking about my non-existent children, I don't think about a whole lot, but, um, <laughs> but you know, they'll be, they, they could easily be around well beyond this 2100 mark. And then, you know, beyond that, maybe I'm thinking about my non-existent grandchildren. <laughs> who could live out to around 2150 or, or, or a little bit beyond. So, I mean, the point of this is that these time horizons, they can be hard to wrap our minds around, but they do, you know, they do matter. They matter to us personally as well as as a society. 
And they're particularly important when we think about infrastructure. Um, infrastructure works on its own time horizon. So if we, if we wanted to build that storm barrier that everybody talked about uh, after Hurricane Sandy for New York, which now they're no longer, they no longer seem to be talking about, but if you wanted to build a big infrastructure project like that, um, you know, it's, it's a long process. Just the engineering and design and conceptualization of that kind of project can take five years. Uh, permitting and, and regulatory matters for actually implementing that, maybe another five to ten years. The actual construction of this kind of project could take another ten years. So, you know, from, from today to actually seeing a major infrastructure project like a storm surge barrier put into place and operating, we could be 25, 30 years out from, from where we are right now. And these are the initial costs on that infrastructure. We expect to get some benefit from that for usually around 50 years for a piece of infrastructure. Uh, so we expect it to kind of pay for itself in 50 years. But we know we can go down to any waterfront uh, and look at infrastructure that's been around for 100 years or more. So, you know, this piece of infrastructure could easily last 125, 150 years. So decisions that we are making today do have some impact on what's going to be happening beyond 2100. So climate change is an issue that many of us have been spending our, our lives working on, our, all of our working hours, we think about these issues. Um, but we also need to remember that there's a lot of other things going on in the world, that there's a lot of other pressing matters, and, and we, we have to kind of think of our climate change agenda within the context of some of these other trends. So this stopped working. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, so world population, you know, we're at 7 billion people right now. And uh, we expect to see over 10 billion by 2085. Um, we are already seeing a, a lot of resource depletion, partly due to climate change, but due to many other factors as well. We, we also have some positive advance, advances with technology in terms of energy sustainability, medical advances that are helping us live longer. And then we have external threats, like whatever it is that's going to happen on Friday in this picture. Um, so, you know, we have, we have nuclear threats, we have uh, pandemic threats. We have a, there's a lot of issues that we, we need to think about at the same time that we're, that we're considering uh, the climate change problem. So I want to turn now to, um, to Lindine because the insurance industry is, is, is thinking very long term. The, the insurance industry is unique, in particular the reinsurance industry is one of the few areas where, where they really think about what's going to be happening decades out and maybe even centuries out. Centuries out? Mm, that's a little far. Yeah, it's a little far. Okay. <laughs> well, but there are out. some. So, we have some futurists who think about that. So I'm going to pass the torch to Lindine to talk a little bit about some of the work that she's been doing in the insurance industry. Great. Thanks, Austin. Um, what I would like to do, other than make this work, uh, is talk a little bit about how our industry is viewing climate change, but more particularly uh, the concerns that we have relative to what we are coining as the climate resilience gap. Um, we have a fundamental resilience gap to begin with, which I'll speak about, um, but climate change simply seems to aggravate that in a multitude of ways. Uh, and I think that the dialogue that we've had on the science side, while interesting, frightening, whatever term you'd like to describe it as, uh, has not yet progressed to the point where we have clear economic impact models. And so I want to talk a little bit about how our industry is looking at that today. But I do want to clarify that our industry is not of one mind on climate change. Um, and that our industry is not necessarily of one focus on climate change in the sense that for primary carriers, most primary insurance carriers offer insurance products that are one year in term. So they're annually renewable. So there's temporal dissonance between the reality of climate change and the reality of our business on the ground. Um, and where we have an instrument that's repriced every year, it's hard for us uh, to legitimately include climate change beyond that climate change which is currently being experienced. And I think many of us in the industry would argue that climate change is happening now. 
Uh, and it's simply that we are responding to what the climate is and what it is for the purpose of the instruments. Where we do begin to look longer term, um, as Austin noted, is in the context of reinsurance. Not just the reinsurers themselves, but we primary carriers look at reinsurance as the methodology for assuring the sustainability of our own business. So we're interested in having multi-year relationships with our reinsurers to make sure that we can have a business which continues because we need to spread our own risk. So I'll give you a little view, or we'll try to, uh, into what our approach is. This is my disclaimer. Um, I am a lawyer, but I have gaggles of lawyers who work for me who insist that we put the disclaimer up here that basically says, I'm going to tell you some information. You can't rely on any of it, but we hope you find it entertaining. Um, so here we go. Uh, how do I set the stage for talking about where we are? Um, and for perhaps giving those of you who are operating in this area a perspective on why some days um, you talk and talk and talk about the science. We talk about the policy implications of sea level rise and other impacts of climate change. And you really get the feeling that you are the first grade teacher that was speaking to Charlie Brown, if you're old enough to remember that cartoon, where all you ever heard on the cartoon was wah, 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 wah. Um, it's because there are a multitude of other external effects. And the current reality today is that we have a resilience gap period, full stop, end of story. We have a circumstance where we have a rising uh, number of events. Um, and these are not just coastal events, but they are dominated, at least in this continent, primarily by coastal events, along with a few tornadoes in between. Um, the character of the events, which and, and a few droughts, and gosh, the list goes on, earthquakes. But uh, they, I would say that those circumstances are increasing both in frequency and in some cases in severity. The challenge is that the way our industry, especially on the reinsurance side, looks at this is we look at all natural hazards in one big giant lump at first when you start to track those statistics. We then begin to break them down into classes of hazard that present themselves. But if you were to look at the US specifically, what you're finding is that, that private insurance is actually, based on the statistics, bearing a smaller and smaller percentage of overall loss from large natural catastrophes. The larger the natural catastrophe, the less is private insured. One of the things that my team's looking at is trying to figure out how that bifurcates into private insurance for, uh, insurance for individuals versus insurance for commercial. Because when you talk to the reinsurers, the reinsurers consistently say that approximately 50% of losses arising out of a named storm event are insured or arising out of a natural catastrophe. The reality is when you begin to dig into the numbers, those numbers are not the same across all lines of business. They are certainly not the same over all named perils, and they are clearly not the same regionally. So kind of like climate change, the answer about whether your natural hazard loss is insured is it depends. <laughs> and it depends on where you are and who you are and what your line of insurance is. But what we are clearly seeing is even when you aggregate all of these, so the upper left-hand corner, and I'm sorry, I didn't realize the screen was going to be this small, but um, the slides will be available. And they, it cites specifically where you can find these, mostly electronically, the data sources. Um, what The upper left-hand uh, uh, quadrant shows a graph which identifies the increasing really frequency and severity of an aggregated series of natural catastrophes um, in the United States over the last 20 years or so. The upper right hand quad quadrant um, splits out insured versus uninsured. So the insured, the total loss is the blue line. All right. The insured, the climatic loss, those associated with weather related events is the red line. And the green line is the insured loss component. What's more interesting to me, however, is in the lower left-hand corner. And this is a graph which comes out of some work done by a professor named David Cummings out of Temple, who has looked at the share of federal payments relative to disasters over the last 20 years. And that number is going up. And it's not going up just a little bit. And you have to keep in mind that number is going up. And that number doesn't even count. That's just federal disaster payments. That does not count um, state-funded pools, local charities, local compensation, nor does it account for economic disruption arising out of these types of events. The lower right-hand quadrant displays Cummings data in a different 
style. So it looks by specific named storms. And again, in the materials, you can go by named storm and cite that. But when you want to talk about a gap, all of you know that there's much hand wringing going on in this country about the unfunded Social Security gap. The time horizon, interestingly, for that unfunded discussion is 75 years. Kind of seeming like it's got some continuity with the time discussion about concerns related to climate change. Interesting to me that we seem to get some traction in discussing, although a very difficult political issue, um, Social Security gap, but not the same kind of traction yet in discussing impacts associated with natural hazards and specifically aggravation caused by climate change. Cummings, who generated the data I showed you in the lower part of the slide, the last slide, actually took it upon himself to go ahead and look at impacts for natural hazards over the same 75-year period, and specifically the unfunded portion, those that are not budgeted in your typical federal budget only, just like you look at the Social Security gap, over that same 75-year period, same $2,008, even got audited and reviewed by the federal government, and they updated it. The range, assuming that the unfunded budget was only $20 billion per year, and in case, $19.3 billion per year. And in case you haven't noticed, we last few years, there's been a, uh, a special appropriation for different parts of the federal government for disaster responses, which has been well in excess of the $19.3 billion target that forms the floor for this 75-year Ford estimate, which, for those of you who can't see, is $1.1 trillion. The upper bound of this estimate assumes, uh, I believe, and someone's going to need to go double check. Um, I should have done this this morning. I apologize. Approximately a 20% of occurrence of $100 billion annual year unfunded special appropriations. And that hits you out into the area of $5.7 trillion. Sounds to me like we are getting well within the range over the same horizon, over the same dollar amounts of the unfunded Social Security budget. Seems to me we should be paying attention to this. When you look at the unfunded portion for a similar, for vari a variable time period, but also reasonably relevant for the state funds that pick up additional exposures, like wind funds, reinsurance of a particular state's um, property insurance fund, those numbers today stand at approximately three trillion dollars. All right, these numbers suggest that this problem for society, this resilience gap, is getting to be in parity with or on par with the gap that we have in our ability to pay Social Security benefits. In other words, it needs a little attention. Um, and I think that we have the capacity to do it. There are a couple of pieces, in my opinion, of, of bright lights out there that are changing the name of the game. The Government Accounting Office this year began to list the issues and risks associated with climate change in their high-risk series. This is critically important because it, it creates a driver of sorts for federal government agencies to pay attention to, because they know they're going to be later audited by, their ability to and their performance in improving their management of the risks identified in the high risk series. And the GAO particularly called out that risks associated with climate change were, were significant they were economically relevant, and they were not being managed well, and without, co and they were not being managed cohesively. Um, and I would commend you to read the, either the testimony um, from uh, the uh, assistance from the Comptroller General, or the testimony for, or the actual report itself, because it'll give you some interesting perspectives about what they found, um, and what they didn't find, and what they suggested uh, happen. As a result of this designation in the high risk report, there will be a series of um, audits. Uh, there was also a request from Congress that I believe um, either 69 or 75, and I'm sorry about not having the right number, uh, agencies were asked, what were you doing? What are you doing, agencies, in response to managing risks associated with climate change? More importantly, they focus particularly on the Agricultural Insurance Program and the National Flood Insurance Program, in addition to FEMA. Identify them, as many of us know, as needing some reform, to it, particularly to encourage risk reduction and eliminate moral hazard, which is baked into many of those programs. And there have been attempts to reform those, and some progress has been made on that reformation, but it's tough, politically very tough. It's important to understand that there are definitions of resilience that exists within the World Bank, 
They exist within Department of Homeland Security. These are things that if you are working in this area and you are interested in understanding how to speak the language that is going to motivate action on the part of people who are controlling budgets, giving money, especially matching funds, it's important that you understand what the rules of the game are that they're going by. And so in the context of the World Bank, the World Bank defines resilience as the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate to, and recover from the effects of hazard in a timely manner, including through the preservation and restoration of the essential basic structures and functions. The DHS definition is the ability to adapt to changing conditions and my vision is not really this good, and withstand and rapidly recover from disruption due to emergencies. One major component of their resilience definition is the capacity of society's assets or its built environment to withstand and quickly recover from weather-related catastrophes. This is really important. DHS controls FEMA. Their NFIP is within their purview. They have other types of activities which are going on that are particularly relevant for disaster recovery. They are the people who are going uh, to Congress and asking for special appropriations. They have an adaptation task force in process. They are focused on this issue, they are interested in this issue, and they are looking to try to make sure that what they invest in um, is improving resilience over time, not increasing or repeating uh, generation of assets that are not resilient. A couple of more points. Um, the thing that particularly concerns our industry is not only the lack of resilience or the reducing or, or deteriorating resilience, um, because it makes assets uninsurable. Just so you know, the, the rule of thumb that you know, Swiss Re and maybe our risk engineers applies, if, if there a large or significant damage is predicted to any particular asset at a frequency of greater than 10%, generally the price signal that we send, the premium that we charge, will be perceived as unaffordable by the community that's receiving the message. So when you think about trying to set boundaries or set a benchmark for looking at improving resilience to the point where it would become reasonably insurable, think 10%, 10% likelihood of loss. Okay. Um, but the thing that concerns us in the insurance industry is not only the lack of resilience, but what happens when you have an, a continuing accrual of lack of resilience, e.g., somebody suffers loss and there's no money to pay for it. Our experience in the industry with other hazards is that people look for someone else whose fault it was. And what does that happen? What happens under those cases? We get litigation. And I wrote a, um, I wrote a book about this that was published by Bar, the Bar Association, uh, American Bar Association, last December, um, that looked at the emerging trends we have in actual climate-related litigation, where plaintiffs who have no other right recourse, both in this country and, and in other countries, 126 jurisdictions to be exact. Um, have ongoing both either civil actions or tort liability actions which are looking to achieve comp compens compensation uh, for losses achieved. The reality is for that litigation is that the science uh, at this point is not meeting the standards in tort liability litigation. But um, there's lots of work going on to try to change the theories. There's a lot of work that's going on to look at trying to associate that. In my personal opinion, not the opinion of my company, in my personal opinion, this is not a good use of capital. Right? It's very inefficient uh, to, to basically decide that the way that you're going to reform and, and achieve resilience is to go through the litigation process. It would be much more efficient for us to invest in engineering, determine functionally what is a good use of engineering services. You can't engineer to zero loss. All right. But you can get yourself down to 10% to the point where you have a residual loss pool, and that's when it becomes efficient to use insurance to spread across regions, across classes of risk, and then leverage your ability to generate capital. But any more, less resilient than that, and we're probably not so efficient. So I'm going to stop there, okay. although I have to get to a question. Um, there it is. <laughs> uh, like to, let me do one more item before I go. You should know that there is something in our business our business does a lot of underwriting. Underwriting fundamentals are, are calculated by a group called generally actuaries. Actuaries do predict predictions about costs and impacts. There is actually a proposed and in-process design, something called the Actuarial Climate Risk Index. It is um, 
Phase one of the project is done. Uh, the citations are here on the slide. Phase, phase two is in process. Phase one uh, asked that um, the act this is this is being sponsored by the Society of Actuaries, the American Academy of Actuaries, the Casualty Actuarial Society. These are all the people that license these people in the in our business. Um, they tried to look at all the indicators, not just the science indicators, but look at the projections for economics. So sticking with our theme, which is why I really have to get to this last slide, is that this particular kind of modeling system and index, which is being proposed by the, by the actuaries, would actually take the data that's being generated by scientists for climatic model and integrate it with economic data to come up with long-term, multi-decadenal, impacts projections by region and by peril. And if anyone's interested, the information's there. I would suggest that they've done a good job in their phase one work. Phase two, I'm a bit concerned, it's pretty ambitious, and I hope that they can get there. Because I think it will be invaluable for people who are working on adaptation and resilience. It will take work that's been done by others, but allow you to convert it into real dollars. But we're not the only ones that are thinking about this. And so I want to turn it over to our uh, Military. So, and just a reminder, um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end. If you have them, write them down, raise your hand, and somebody will come and pick them up and bring them to me. As soon as they load, I will talk quickly. <laughs> so, um, my name is Kelly Burks Copes. I'm from the Environmental Lab. I'm the lead PI on a new study that the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers just recently completed for the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, which is a joint DOD DOE. Um, research, resource initiative that asks for the, um, you know, scientists of the community to start looking at particular issues that are threatening or possibly um, enhancing military readiness and um, troop support. So one of the studies that I want to talk to you about today is the CERTIP RC1701 study. They always, acronyms are a famous thing of the military, and so if I do say an acronym and I don't explain it, which I just explained CERTIP, I owe everybody a beer, okay? <laughs> the purpose of our study was to basically create a risk-enabling framework, something that would um, robustly assess climate uh, change impacts, specifically sea level rise assessment, um, characterize those impacts, uh, th pinpoint um, thresholds or tipping points where minor annoyances that would take the military only a couple, couple of hours to repair and be back up and running. We would actually start finding that those, those impacts would take weeks or even months to repair and therefore the mission would be down and severely threatened. And then convey that information back to the field so that they could start making changes and, and starting to look at their what we call rack and stacking, which is the idea that there are assets out on the field and they're older, they're getting older, and so there is an idea that we would be um, retrofitting or, or replacing those, but in the face of climate change and sea level rise, that timeline might shrink and you might need to do those retrofits or accommodations much sooner than what they have planned. And they have five-year budgets, so they look five years out for things like peer replacements all the way down to transformer exchanges. And so we could start helping them rack and stack smarter uh, in the face of this kind of threat. So it's a tiered risk-based assessment, and I'm going to push buttons so that it goes much faster. There's a test at the end. Um, at the top, there's a box that's gone, which is climate change, and particularly sea level rise. And our team used a series of 11 hydrodynamic models um, coupled with asset models to assess forcings. The idea is winds, waves, surge, and flooding all threaten the livelihood of a military installation. And if we can decompose the mission and talk about those critical assets that are required to be operational for us to be able to do things like bring in aircraft carriers and turn them back around and send them back, um, we can pinpoint those vulnerabilities and start asking, are they, are they capable of withstanding the threats or do they need some kind of accommodation or retrofit to be able to condition, to basically make sure that the mission can perform. Uh, there will not be a test on this. I'll run it very quickly, but we did kind of a baseline assessment. We, we focused on the Hampton Roads area, uh, looked specifically at Naval Station Norfolk, which is at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. It happens to be the largest uh, naval operations in the world. Um, there's numerous numbers of boats that come in, ships that come in, sorry, and are turned around as well as uh, subs. 
And we um, did this kind of uh, analysis with the assumption not that we were going to model climate change. The idea was not to step look at differences in sea level rise, but we also looked at increases in storms. So we looked at the annual event, something that happens every single year, all the way out to events that only have a 1% chance of happening, those 100-year storm events. Um, let's see, Katrina was a four or five when it hit landfall. Um, San Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy was about a three. Um, and those are based on, those are categorical storms based on winds. We didn't look at winds specifically. We categorized our storms based on floods. So that's one of the things that you need to know before we start looking at the study. We used something called SLAM, which is the sea level rise affecting marsh model, to project forward uh, what kind of inundation we were likely to see with um, sea level rise. And I cannot tell if this is moving forward or not fast enough. There we go. So out to the year 2100, what kind of changes we were likely to see in terms of inundation, switching, biome switching. Then we take that and put it up under storms. FEMA has been remapping the region since post-Katrina. Uh, they have run over 500 simulated hurricanes. Uh, one of the things to be aware of when you're doing uh, storm modeling is that what happened in the past is not likely to be our future. Um, we, as we mentioned earlier, we're likely to see uh, stronger storms, uh, increasing stronger storms. On the coastline, they're not clear whether those are going to be more frequent storms, but the impacts are likely to be something we've never seen before. And so we were, um, fr frankly, we were involved in the FEMA remapping, and so we used those storms and put sea level rise scenarios up underneath them. We focused on two storms specifically. One of them was a 50-year event, and one of them was a 100-year event. The 50-year event goes straight across the installation. The 100-year storm comes in and takes a left. Um, just anecdotally, when we picked that simulation, um, I was told to my face that storms don't do that, that they don't come in and take a left, OK? <laughs> This is the beauty of using simulations instead of historic storms. We could simulate something that then the next year turned into Superstorm Sandy. Um, we took that and generated wind speeds for each of the storms, and then we generated a surge and wave. So I'm trying to get it to switch, and it's not. There we go. So on the uh, left-hand side is a 100-year storm event. We used this advanced circulation simulating near shore, uh, waves near shore. <laughs> <laughs> to basically run not only um, surge and winds um, and the inundation underneath it, but to compare and contrast what would happen if we had a two-meter sea level rise up under that same storm. And we didn't change any of the storm parameters except for sea level rise. So if you run the one on the left, what you'll see is a little bit of inundation and some surge along the, the, the uh, ports on the left-hand side. If you run the same storm with sea level rise, um, go ahead and click that one, what you're going to see is a catastrophic event. We're talking um, in the magnitude of nine meters of surge, um, 27 feet. So find a fishing pole in the tallest building, OK? And that's not going to hit just the base. It's going to hit all the surrounding coastline. On the next slide, what you'll see then is taking that information and not only looking at surge, but adding precipitation and starting asking the question, what about saltwater intrusion into the aquifer? And where will all that water go? And what you'll see is that the installation is simply unprepared to deal with this catastrophic event. They've never seen it before. They're not planning for it now, but they could if they have this kind of information. We not only looked at this, but we looked at nor'easters. The nor'easters that we simulated were in the range of a 50-year storm. Um, what I want to impress upon you is that even a small level of sea level rise and a small one-year event is going to generate flooding that they have not experienced before and they frankly are not prepared for. And this kind of information allows them to start asking where, where are their critical failures? Where are we likely to start seeing vulnerabilities? And then how might we set our budget so that we can improve upon our resiliency? 
Um, we do this by decomposing the mission and asking the question what assets are out there above and below ground and what are they made of. Um, one of the examples that we can talk about is steam. All of the steam systems on the Naval Station, by the way, steam is a big thing in the Navy. That's what they use to cook and clean, and um, it's all, all of the infrastructure is up above ground, um, three to, to 15 feet in the air, and so they are particularly vulnerable. Um, we mapped where all of the steam came into the piers, how they backed up into distribution systems that were then connected to boilers, that were then connected to electricity, water, and fuels, and how those reached the base. And so we looked at what was on the base, but we also asked the question, what about infrastructure outside the fence line? And these bases are likely to be embedded inside of municipalities. So everything that we're talking about in terms of vulnerabilities is also tied to the city grid, for example, and the city reservoir. Then we could go in and do something called dial a storm. We created a, pro a, a probability network, a conditional probability network, um, where you can literally say, I want to look at a particular sea level, sea level rise scenario. I want to look at a particular storm severity. Where are my critical failures? At what, at what point are we going to see those thresholds or tipping points? And how does that affect mission? And we can literally pinpoint where risks increase under each of the different scenarios. There's more than 13 probabilities in the, in the Dallas storm right now. This allows us to tell the military what services are likely to be imperiled, which ones are going to go first. It allows us to ask what that tipping point is, where those minor annoyances turn into severe catastrophic events. Um, for the base in Naval Station Norfolk, that's the difference between a half meter and one meter of sea level rise. That lets their planners start thinking about forward projections and how they might start thinking proactively to address the issue. Instead of looking at just a half meter, they should start looking at the one meter scenarios. Um, we also looked at, on a, at, a, at an installation on peer by peer basis, which peers were the most uh, sensitive. Turns out there's a double decker pier that they just built on the installation in the last decade that is designed for the Ford class, which hasn't even come off the line yet. Um, they made economic decisions based on current policy of where they positioned their infrastructure on that double decker. A lot of it is on the, on the lower deck and it's not flood proof for sea level rise. It's flood proof for conditions today, not for potential conditions tomorrow. So what our study allows them to do is start thinking about this proactively and racking and stacking their, um, their budgets based on what the real threats are for their installation. I'll hold on to this. Are yours working? I think mine might be working now. <laughs> okay. um, Thanks, both of you. Great perspectives on long-term thinking. Um, here's our first question from the audience. And I'll just, either one of you can, can address this. Do you see a long-term future for federal flood insurance, or should it be transferred to the, to the, to the private sector? I guess maybe that's That's Lindine. <laughs> mm, that's not a hot potato at all. Uh, <laughs> um, I would tell you that, again, the insurance industry is, is of two minds on this. I think the reality is, uh, at this point, that the federal government will be in this process for a while, e either way. But this is a, a social decision, which really has to have a continued dialogue, uh, I think, about what it is that we want as a society to continue to support. Um, it's very clear. Uh, that at this point in time, um, the, f the flood insurance program has had some reforms. It has also had some history of encouraging or permitting continued development um, in high-risk areas. Uh, I think that there are going to be some difficult discussions, especially with entire municipalities that are within flood zones. But there are some companies who have come up and asked to have more participation uh, in flood insurance. There are others who have not. Um, and I think for the insurance industry, the key is always assuring that we can uh, basically send risk-based price signals. That's the, the point of our business, is to send a risk-based price signal. Another for you, that's a premium. That premium tells you just how risky what you're doing is. Um, and again, if it begins to get more in a circumstance where you're more, more than 10% likely to be completely inundated, um, then maybe you either have to look at an engineering solution or you have to look at a change in location, or both. Uh, and these are very hard 
um, discussions to go forward. So there is no answer to that. I'm, it's probably not what you want, but I think they're going to be there for a while. What, what about the federal government purchasing private reinsurance? Um, there is something called the self-insurance rule, which the Comptroller General is quite familiar with. Um, in fact, I think it dates back to the late 1700s. In short, uh, the underlying policy of, as I understand it, is that the federal government has more money than any private insurer would ever have. Um, and as a consequence, it is not economically efficient um, or appropriate for the uh, government to transfer that. That said, there are lots of programs, defense-based rating program, there are other programs in which uh, private insurers administer, including the National Flood Insurance Program, um, pro processes where it is more efficient for a private industry to administer uh, distribution of federal funds, and that happens in many cases. I do not see that changing um, on a go-forward basis. Um, okay, for Kelly, um, when it comes to the, to the to the threats that you were looking at in your study, what, what do you feel like is very well understood at this point and we can kind of say, all right, we know all about this, and, and, are, and, and which areas do you think are really still pretty fuzzy? So one of the things we did was model storms without any climate change modeling coupled to those storm models. Um, we made a very basic assumption that the storms would only increase in strength based on the sea level rise, the open surface of the water increasing underneath those storms. So less friction, there's stronger storms. One of the things that we really need, and, and Dr. Sullivan addressed this in her discussions this morning, are better climate change models with more, where we can place more confidence in the outcomes. Once that's done, we can couple that to the storm models and give you a better idea about what the storm impacts are likely to be. Um, in all likelihood, they're going to be even worse than what we're showing on our estimates right now. Um, that's one of the, the big uh, cans of worms that has just started to open up with global climate change model downscales. Um, okay, I have two questions here that are sort of similar about the, uh, the model. Um, basically, th they're both asking, what are the next steps with the model? Ah. Is the model going to be used for evaluating more military installations? And is it ready to be used by other communities to evaluate their infrastructure? And kind of what would it take to, to get there if it's not quite ready? Okay, so it is transferable. Um, it's uh, one of the things that we've been looking at in the Virginia area is a series of town hall meetings with the Virginia stakeholders area. We, we recognize clearly that the, in, the installation is not the only impact zone, that the impact zone is across the area. And so whatever the military is thinking about and how they're preparing is relevant to those people outside the fence line. So the model is transportable. A lot of the results are at the regional scale. We've already shared um, some of that information with the Virginia remapping. I think it's called the Virginia Recurrent Flooding Study. I don't think they're allowed to say climate change. They're allowed to say recurrent flooding. And so we um, gave them some data and helped them generate some maps to talk about threats because they are literally faced with not only um, sea level rise due to climate change, but sea level rise due to subsidence, um, groundwater withdrawal and that kind of thing is also leading to rising tides in those areas. And so the, what I want to say clearly is the model's ready. We're, we've got all of the science um, behind it and we're ready to deploy it um, where needed. Uh, what's not clear is where we should go yet. And so we're definitely open to opportunities and collaborations along those lines. And in fact, we're um, talking with the Navy's Task Force Climate Change as we speak about where their vulnerable installations lie and what kind of level of detail of risk assessment they need to be able to make um, uh, smart choices about what to do um, in that kind of risk or environment. Did you say how much it cost? It? No. <laughs> so, so it's it was a three million. It was a two million dollar study through CERTIP. It was um, we took advantage of another million dollars of FEMA modeling. Um, we got those for free. Um, I foresee an economy of scale as we move forward. We've figured out the science. We know how to couple the models. We've used them. We have all the scientists on board. I didn't, I didn't do this study. I have uh, 21 research scientists on my team that actually came together to do this study. So we've got a wide and deep bench to take on the world, and we're ready to go with that. But it won't be a $2 million exercise every single time. OK. Um, Lindine, we have a question for you. Um, Swiss Re is beginning to look at green coastal defenses in its insurance pricing. Um, are you familiar with that, and can you comment on it? Um, I think that, yes, I am somewhat familiar with it. It is latitudinally uh, 
relevant, right? So not every location can have um, particular types of ecological systems that allow reduction of physical risk from, let's say, waves or uh, some other activity that ca could cause either water or wind damage. Uh, we clearly, as an industry, have an opportunity to look at that. Um, there are not, it's not only Swiss Re who's looking at this, there are a series of energy companies who are quite interested in this because they have offshore resources mm -hmm. that if sea level rise proceeds will no longer be, let's say, in a tidal area or it will no longer be in a wetland and therefore won't be land, it will be ocean. <laughs> um, it has very, very serious ownership implications in addition to the value that those wetlands may present um, in terms of reducing physical impact of the natural catastrophe. So the kind of modeling that needs to get done for that is, is different from but similar to what, um, what was just reviewed. And I think that these are the types of things that we need to really begin to look at. Uh, the challenge we have, and I think this is really important to understand, engineers have been really good at convincing people that they understand what the risks are to concrete structures, you know, to basically bricks and mortar and concrete and steel, man-made stuff. Don't, they don't, people don't seem to be concerned about the fact that those are built, but somewhere in the plans people list tolerances for that, right? Okay, so to me, tolerance is just uncertainty in terms of how well it perform. Biologic scientists tend to communicate in the concepts of uncertainty. The, the, the problem that presents is that uh, financial community is really totally interested in investing in things that have you know, particular tolerances. If you tell them that there's an uncertainty about whether something's going to perform, the finance people say, oh my gosh, I can't invest in that. So what we're seeing is whether it's wastewater treatment or whether it is a choice between doing some natural um, plant or uh, ecosystem mitigation when compared with, let's say, designing a flood wall or doing some type of um, increased volume for a wastewater treatment plant versus having a permeable surface, the finance community is finding it very easy to argue that you should issue bonds for gray infrastructure. We're still having difficulty for green infrastructure. Now, where that green infrastructure is ordered by law as a part of a settlement, you can still get the bonds issued. Where it is not, it is more tricky because of the communication style. So I would encourage those of you who are interested in assuring that ecosystem services are valued in this context to consider changing your language of communication to incentivize and make comfortable the financial services committee or financial services community uh, so that they will have confidence to invest in these projects and not feel as though they're doing something that's too risky for their groups. So, and the Corps of Engineers post Sandy is looking at green infrastructure solutions in light of the fact that a great deal of the green infrastructure did protect the coastline and the built infrastructure failed. And there is an, an enormous initiative this summer um, in my labs to work on metrics and ecosystem service, goods and services metrics to help quantify better what the return on investment of green infrastructure is in light of the fact that it will have to age and grow and, and, res and be resilient in the future in the face of this. Yeah, there's, there's one really important thing that now we get to, you know. Now we get to interact. Play after it, um, <laughs> is that uh, if you look at gray infrastructure, it's primarily a capital investment that can be amortized over time. The financial models are very well and predictable. And if you know anybody who's gone to business school, there's been lots of emphasis over the last several decades to try to eliminate that irritating operation and maintenance expense and focus on capital investments. Why? Because those operation and maintenance expenses are volatile. They, have, they, they suffer from things like inflation and other types of expenses on a long-term basis. Suggesting that someone invests in ecosystem services turns that business model on its head. So you need to understand you are swimming upstream to try to get people in the financial services industry to invest there. That is, a, is a, an area where our community has to work harder, get smarter, um, come up with models that justify that return on investment, but do it in a way not only that convinces them that the uncertainty is manageable, just like tolerances for engineering, but also convinces people that it's okay to have O&M costs and maybe those are predictable, because right. right now it's not. Okay, I've got two last questions. Um, the first is, um, you know, the, the, despite the resource challenges that we're currently facing in, in the U.S., we 
do have many more resources than other places in the world. Mm -hmm. And we've been focusing on these issues more than a lot of places, in particular more than a lot of developing nations. Are there ways that um, each of you have shared or have you've seen examples of how some of the knowledge that's being developed in the U.S. Um, in the military and the government and the insurance sector has been shared with other nations and in particular with developing nations? Wow. <laughs> so um, the U.S. military is not positioned on the U.S. It's positioned globally. And so a lot of the initiatives that we've undertaken um, in the Corps of Engineers and the Navy and the Army, although we try it out on our installations, what we have learned is that it is transferable beyond the fence line. And so there are instances all around the world, I could give you several, several examples, where what we have designed strategically works not only for the installation but for the local communities and the actual regions. And so there is this potential possibility for them to learn from us and to actually collaborate with us to do kind of a broader regional scale defense. From the insurance industry perspective, the answer is absolutely, um, but you need to figure it in context. Uh, the, the, in most emerging markets, the, the agriculture plays a very big role, so the majority of the pro projects which have looked at deploying insurance to improve resilience have focused on the agricultural context um, to try to improve water management, to reduce the use of um, fertilizers, to make sure that uh, there are efficiency gains and that there are predictability gains in terms of the way water gains in terms of the way water is managed so that there is more predictability and less volatility in generation of yield um, and that actually increases economic sustainability for the farmers in those regions we've seen that um, multitude of places in Africa we've seen it in parts of Southeast Asia um, where there are particular projects and if someone wants to talk about it afterwards I can life insurance is the other area the challenge that we face in using the insurance in instrument in particular in emerging markets is that culturally there is not the same type of familiarity nor is there the same acceptance of um, market-based systems, uh, to the kind of market-based system we have, um, nor is there familiarity with the type of instruments that we offer. Uh, so that in order to deploy these to improve resilience to, or to facilitate resilience using the pooling methodologies that we have from the market place, um, it requires more than just providing someone the instrument. You have to have a, a whole host of activities, so it generally requires partnering both with NGOs and governments in order to deploy that and coming up with mechanisms that revolve on technology so that we can overcome the extreme frictional costs that are necessary. If our knowledge base is in a developed market and we're trying to sell in an emerging market and the average premium cost or premium for a, a policy is like 50 cents, um, just thinking about it costs more than the premium of the policy for <laughs> the people who are trying to design it. Uh, so these tend to be charitable activities uh, so far until the market is up on its place and you have to have in-country resources in order to um, have them continue to work economically. All right. Um, okay, well I think we're, we're due for lunch. Um, so let's thank our speakers here. and.